Edwards and I'm going to be continuing the series on uh, the Ravening Wolves, Filthy Lucre, and specifically in this video I want to address the issue of the Doctrine of Balaam. What is the Doctrine of Balaam? How do you know? And what passages does it come from? So the Doctrine of Balaam is actually something that is very easy to determine, um, but it kind of shines the light in great detail on a practice that most pastors, preachers, bishops, elders want no light shined on whatsoever because uh, it goes against their interest. And I'm convinced that most of them have no idea that what they're doing is actually the doctrine of Balaam. And if they did know, I would like to believe that most of them would stop. Uh, that remains to be seen. And honestly, it probably won't be until a lot of other believers basically get in their faces about it and say, what you're doing is wrong. We're not going to support this anymore. You need to start following a Paul principle or a Paul rule and go get a job, earn your own money kind of thing. Uh, until that happens, corporation Christianity will not change their method of what they're doing, partially because they have no other way to support their unbiblical structure of what they're doing and uh and so you know it's one of those things that the chips will have to fall where they are and they'll either change or they'll be judged for it by god but to get into this the doctrine of balaam is something that is mentioned uh once in the new testament in the book of revelation and the ways of balaam and the error of balaam is also mentioned in right in that same area and so it just kind of goes to show that in first century christianity there was such a thing that was defined as the doctrine of balaam and it all revolved around something that balaam did so to find out what that is we need to kind of look back at the story of balaam and we need to figure out what exactly it was that he did that created this idea of the doctrine of Balaam. So to begin with, let's go to Revelation chapter two and verse 14. It says, but I have a few things against thee because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who, caused, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So in a plain reading there, it would appear that the doctrine of Balaam was to eat things offered to idols and to convince the children of Israel to commit fornication. I am going to say that that is not necessarily the doctrine of Balaam. That was the result of the doctrine of Balaam. Okay, and I'll show that and prove that here as we go a little bit further. So one of the next places that it mentions this error or way of the doctrine of Balaam is in the little tiny book of Jude. In the book of Jude, verse 11, it says, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward. There's a big clue right there as to what the doctrine of Balaam is. They've run greedily after the error of Balaam for reward, and they've perished in the gainsaying of Korah. Okay, and it goes on down through there and kind of gives a little bit more information about that, okay? So the third place that you find this idea of the way of Balaam, the doctrine of Balaam, the error of Balaam in the New Testament is in 2 Peter chapter 2. Um, and verse 15, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Now, this is very important. And you saw in Jude that they ran greedily after the way of Balaam for a reward. They're doing what Balaam did specifically for the reward. So for many of you who know the story of Balaam and the children of Israel, uh, I'm not going to go through it, but I do want to go back and look at that story because that gives us the, the framework for what Balaam, who Balaam was, what he did, why he did it, and what the results of that were. So if you have your Bibles, if you'll turn back to Numbers chapter 22, Numbers chapter 22 through 24 gives the story of Balaam, how that Balak was the king of Moab, 
and all of Moab was concerned and worried that the children of Israel were going to just swallow them up like ants and grasshoppers. And so they're trying to figure out exactly what they're going to do with these people that have come up out of Egypt in the Exodus. And it looks like they're just going to just wipe Moab out. And so Balak ends up and he comes up with the idea of getting Balaam, who was a prophet who undoubtedly had a connection with God. And Balak was going to pay Balaam to curse these people. And by doing so, he was hoping that that would remove the threat to Moab. So if you look in, in Numbers chapter 22, you'll get a lot of that story that I just gave you. But it's really interesting to me. In verse 6, Come now therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people, for they are too mighty for me. Peradventure I shall prevail that we may smite them and that I may drive them out of the land. For I wot, or I know that he whom thou blessest is blessed and he whom thou cursest is cursed. So Balaam has this reputation. And the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the rewards of divination in their hand. That's a key phrase, the rewards of divination in their hands. And they came unto Balaam and spake unto him the words of Balak. And he said unto them, Lodge here this night, I will bring you word again, as the Lord shall speak unto me. And the princes of Moab abode with Balaam. So it's interesting when you look at this, Balak sends these rewards of divination to Balaam. And if you follow the story, you've got this really inter interesting story where this dumb donkey speaks and rebukes Balaam because Balaam is going and he has every intention of cursing these, the people of Israel. And as you follow through the story, chapters 22, chapters 23, chapters 24, it goes through and there's several places where Balak has taken Balaam up on these mountains to curse. And every time God says, no, you can't curse him. All you can do is bless them. And Balaam does so. And he's really making this Balak mad, makes him very mad until you get to Numbers chapter 24 and you have this prophecy that Balaam speaks about Christ coming out of Jacob, etc. And chapter 24 ends with, um, and Balaam rose up and went and returned to his place and Balak also went his way. The story seems to end on a note that says that Balak tried to hire Balaam Balaam couldn't speak against God. And so finally, you know, they give up. Balak returns to his house and Balaam returns to his house. Supposedly, without receiving this reward of divination. However, when you go to the next chapter, the next chapter, it seems like there's this break and it's just moving on to something else. But in the next chapter, in chapter 25, you see where these women of Moab have come into the camp and they are, the children of Israel are committing fornication with these women from Moab. And it seems to be totally uh, divorced or removed from anything that Balaam might have done, right? Until you look at Numbers chapter 31 verses 15 and 16. And in, Mo, in Numbers 31, verses 15, it says, And Moses said unto them, Have ye saved all the women alive? Behold, these caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. This is pretty serious. So... The story with Balaam does not end in chapter 24 where Balaam just goes his own way. He ends up having a neutral effect and even a positive effect against the children of Israel. While that did happen, there was something about that, div that reward of divination that just had Balaam. Balaam was greedy. Balaam was covetous. And so Balaam leveraged his relationship with God to be able to receive this reward of divination. He utilized his knowledge of God to gain money. 
And the interesting thing is, is that even though he did not curse Israel with his mouth, like King Balak wanted him to, he still put the, the knowledge and the information that King Balak needed into his hands to be able to conquer Israel. What was that? Basically, Balaam, Balaam used the principle of binding the strong man. Binding the strong man, if Satan is the enemy and the adversary and God is our strong man, Satan does not have the ability to bind our strong man. Satan does not have the ability to curse us as believers in Christ. He has no power. But the idea of binding the strong man, Satan cannot bind the strong man. But God, our strong man, binds himself to blessings and cursings. If we obey blessings, if we disobey curses. And Balaam could not of himself speak a curse against God's people. But what he did instead to earn this reward of divination is he explained to Balak what Balak could do to get the children of Israel to bind their own strong man and bring God's curses upon themselves. And how did he do that? Balak got them to eat things that were offered to idols, which was a direct violation of Torah. And Balak also got them to sleep with people who were outside of their covenant of Israel. And so when he does that, if you read in Numbers chapter 25, in verse 9 it says, Those that died in the plague were twenty and four thousand. 24,000 Israelites died. And the only reason why it was stayed is because Phinehas, who was the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, he sees this and he takes a javelin and he goes into the midst of the camp and he spears, he pins both of them through with a javelin. And that stops the plague. This is a pretty fast spreading plague. If he had not done that, God only knows how many people would have died because Balaam loved the wages of unrighteousness. And Balaam took his relationship and his knowledge of who God was and what it was and he exchanged them or he leveraged them for money. That's the doctrine of Balaam. When you take what you know and your relationship with God and you leverage that into filthy lucre. Money that you should not have for something that you know or something that you can do that's directly related to God. Now, with that being said, turn back to 2 Peter chapter 2, Verse 1, there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies. The doctrine of Balaam is a damnable heresy. Even deny the Lord that brought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness, which was Balaam's sin, shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. God's people. Long and short, you look at Corporation Christianity today or any assembly that names the name of Christ and someone is leveraging who they are, what they know as a position of authority and they basically have become a hireling and they receive wages and salary for their service that they perform for you before God. That is not a first century principle. That is not anything that the first century Christians practiced. And maybe in the next uh, video I'll get into Paul because that he becomes the he becomes the poster boy and the writer in the New Testament that everybody goes to to prove why. The bishop, the deacon, the elders should receive and should be subsidized for what they do in their labors in the ministry for the assembly.
I'm sorry. It is a doctrine of Balaam, and it is a damnable heresy. So with that being said, if you've enjoyed this, stick around. There's more to come. There's a lot more in here. In the last series of videos, I set the foundation for, um, for how the priests were considered robbers and what that was all about. In this one, I've, I've shown the doctrine of, of Balaam and what it involves. And in the next one, we're going to start in on the New Testament, look at some of Paul's writings, and start looking at a lot of scriptures in the New Testament dealing with men who are in positions of authority in the church and their injunctions to not be covetous, to not use their position uh, for filthy lucre, to not be greedy of gain, uh, on and on and on it goes. But rather, they're to labor with their own hands and that, Paul, that that is what Paul has taught them to do not to use any kind of position of, of authority that they have to be able to take from their brothers. Okay. So if you've enjoyed the video, hit the like button, hit subscribe and, and, uh, the bell so you can get alerts whenever we put out a new video. Okay. God bless you. Have a good day.